Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Kiyoki Stender, scuba enthusiast and marine life photographer. Today, we're going to talk about Hawaii and other places like Palau, too, I suppose, marine life. So let's get into it. Kiyoki, how did you get interested in scuba diving and photography? Well, when I was really young, my grandma would take me to the ocean and we would turn over rocks and find shells and my grandpa would, would catch octopus and my dad used to fish. So I always had an interest in the ocean and the things that live in it. Uh, and it just became my career path through, through college. And so it was just it always part of me. So how did you get started with scuba certification? So with scuba, uh, in my senior year at Kamehameha, they offered scuba in mm -hmm. for PE, and oh, I was not great. I was not an athlete, so I I didn't I couldn't catch a ball, I couldn't run, I had asthma, and so swimming <laughs> and surfing were the only things that were in, I was into. And I said, hey, you know, scuba that's an easy one to pass. So, and I can get <laughs> I can go collect shells too. So it was um, it was a no brainer, and it was free. Yeah, um, that's good. <laughs> so it, that was my introduction to scuba. And, and since then, I have had various jobs using scuba or working in scuba shops. Mm -hmm. how, how about photography? How did you get into photography? So when I was a college student, I was a student employee for the Marine Option Program at Wimmer Community College. And every summer, we would have a, um, a coral reef um, ecological survey techniques workshop course. And part of that course, a big part of it was learning how to identify fish, corals, seaweeds, invertebrates. And we had to go through slideshows and write down the, the scientific names of every species. Wow. And, you know, this was back in the, uh, the late 1980s, early 1990s, when it was all slide film. Yeah. So if you didn't have the slide, you didn't have a picture, you couldn't just go download something, there was no internet. Mm -hmm. So it was either you had it or you didn't have it. And so there were some gaps in the collection at the university. So I thought it would be a great idea to learn how to use a camera underwater and fill those gaps with pictures. So I um, proposed a student project, uh, which was too expensive and got turned down. <laughs> but that same year when the semester started, I got some grant money from, uh, from Kamehameha to pay my tuition and pay for books and things. And so it, I spent it on cameras and film and wow. I started doing it from scratch. So what did you start with? What kind of camera did you start with? Well, to take photos of fishes, you have to have a, an SLR camera, interchangeable lens camera. And so I looked into what brands and what models. And I got a Pentax just because you could use old lenses, new lenses, um, and it had autofocus. Mm -hmm. So I got the, the Pentax camera and I bought an iClight housing with, with some flashes. And I just basically read some books at the library and mm -hmm. learned how to set exposure and take pictures. And that was just, you know, yeah. self-taught. Self-taught, that's great. And then did you, I mean, how about the housing? How did you figure out what to do with the housing? You just kind of looked up whatever went with the Pentax and. Right. So when I did the research, I looked, I was working for a dive shop. And so I looked at the catalog and what they were offering. And so I just picked the, the brand of camera that was affordable and that had a matching housing and they were promoting the Pentax kit with the camera and the housing. So it was like, okay, I'll get this one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I switched to Canon later on, um, maybe about 15 years in. Yeah. And then why are you saying that fish you can only you can only take with an SLR camera versus a point and shoot, for instance? OK, so with most compact cameras, they have a wide angle lens or a GoPro. The wide angle lens makes mm -hmm. everything look smaller. Yeah. You have to be really close to it. And of course, if you know fish, in Hawaii, where they're being speared all the time, mm -hmm. or chased by tourists, the yeah. fish run. Mm -hmm. And 
the rule of photography underwater is to get as close as possible. And yeah. that means three feet or less. Yeah. So if you imagine a parrotfish, there's yeah. no way anybody can get within three feet of a parrotfish around here because yeah. they're going to run. So if you have a telephoto lens mounted on your camera, yeah. it has a much narrower angle of view. Therefore, on the frame, the fish will fill the frame better. It'll look bigger in the picture. So an SLR camera allows you to do that. So you're using a zoom lens a lot on the camera, or do you just use like a normal macro lens? So it depends. Um, I have about five different lenses I would choose from based upon where I'm at and what subject I would expect to see or what do I want to, what kind of images do I want to create. So I could use a zoom lens and if I'm on travel and I don't know what I'm going to see, or if they say, well, there's sea fans, there's turtles, there's sharks, and there's nudibranchs, sea slugs. Mm -hmm. So I would use a zoom lens because it, it can shoot some wide, shoot some bigger things close up, as well as some smaller things pretty close up, but not super, super close up. Um, it's a kind of a catch all. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, you know, it does everything, but not especially great. Mm -hmm. If I know what I want, I'll either use a fisheye lens for a whale or I'll use a macro lens with a narrow angle of view for the tiny critters, the mm -hmm. damselfish, um, sea slugs, snails, those kind of things. Yeah. And how, I mean, the problem is, is that you have to choose your lens before you go underwater because you can't change it underwater. So that's the difficulty because sometimes you go and you only have the lens and then you're just... You just have to make do. You just have to learn how to use what you got. And then sometimes I yeah. uh, get in the water, well, I got no good pictures today because I have the wrong lens. And yeah. that's just why you keep going back in the water every single time, because you can go to the same place 10 times and see different things every time. And if you start adding the equation of a lens, then you even, you know, you have even more opportunities to, to find and see new things. Do you feel like, you know, it's possible at all? I don't know if you know any of the over-the-counter underwater point-and-shoot cameras. Uh, do, you, do you know any of them or any of them, you know, possible? To, like, would you recommend any of the over-the-counter point-and-shoot kind of cameras for people who are just beginning and maybe they just want to get into it and they don't want to put a whole lot of money into it yet with an SLR camera and then a housing? <laughs> yeah, so... Um... It is, like you say, in an SLR housing, it's, it's a 20 pound beast. It's big, it's heavy, it creates a lot of drag. So it, that's a whole, it's a big commitment. And of course the, the money required for that. On the other hand, you know, if you just want to be real simple, like traveling uh, and spend less than say $500, you can get an Olympus TG series, TG oh. four, five, six. Mm -hmm. um, we have one of those too. And in a housing, but they're waterproof. So if you are really, really minimal, you can just go in with the camera and snorkel and do some shallow scuba with it. And you can zoom the lens. You can shoot some wide stuff with turtles and then zoom okay. it in and get sea slugs and close-ups of little things on the reef or coral polyps. So it's a very versatile system and you can add flashes or close-up lenses or wide angle lenses, you know, if you want to upgrade. So that is, is my recommendation, Olympus TG series. And how much is that kind of camera like? Uh, between three to $500 mm -hmm. if you're buying new or used. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I guess that's, that's a good option for people because, you know, it is kind of daunting to go with the housing. And I mean, it, suppose you did want to buy, suppose you did want to completely commit though. And because, you know, with the SLR, it's great. You can use it above ground, too, and get multiple lenses. And then, you know, if you're already a photographer, but you just want to get into the underwater photography, what would you say was the most difficult thing for you to get used to with underwater photography? Um, and if there's any mistakes that you made that you can help out other people so they don't make the same mistakes, I guess. So like I was saying, the, the trick to getting good underwater photos is to get close to your subject. Mm -hmm. So minimizing the water between you and the subject is going to help to reduce the amount of uh, cloudiness, murkiness, greenness mm -hmm. of the image. And also, if you're snorkeling, you, you're in shallow water, so there's sufficient sunlight. But if you get deeper and deeper, the water gets, gets bluer and bluer because the sunlight is getting filtered out. So 
as you get into the deeper realm, you're going to have to either do a custom white balance or which is technical, but, or to add a flash to it. Um, when it comes to using a flash, if the water is not perfectly clear and there's no sand stirred up and there's no bubbles floating around, you're going to see a bunch of snowstorm in, um, in your images. And so because uh, of all the particulates, so a flash takes some skill too. Yeah. That seems like that would take a lot of skill. Do you ever bring, you know, how on land they have, people have like the umbrellas and everything or like, you know, for portrait photography, do people do that underwater? Uh, not really. So whatever you can carry. Well, if you have, if you're a, you know, the top pros and you have five assistants with five cameras and you, you can carry the whole, you know, everything, all the boatload of stuff for you, mm -hmm. of course, you're going to get some good pictures, but you know, the reality is most of us are diving, you know, with a buddy that's not going to want to carry anything. So yeah, it's pretty much your, your self-contained. So you have a, a flash with an arm if you have mm -hmm. the money for that or you just take the point and shoot and you just shoot with the built-in flash um yeah. there's there's so many people on instagram that have fantastic sea slug pictures especially mm -hmm. into japanese they, and they just use the 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 stock camera with the stock flash it's just they get great pictures learning how to use your equipment is the trick to getting proficient at it you have to learn what your camera is good at and not good at and focus upon doing uh what it is good at yeah and with the something like the olympus how deep does that go generally like these um i, I know think... they don't go you know that deep that's the thing so without the housing i think they without can the go to say 30 to 40 feet yeah uh, but if you buy the either Olympus housing or an Eichlite housing for it, you can take it down to say 150. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But as you, of course, you go deeper or you so, have the housing, you may not have as much flash potential. It yeah. may not, it may affect, affect the flash. So you will probably want to add on a, mm -hmm. a flash. Is there anything you can do if it's murky um, to kind of compensate for that or no? Are there any, um, so nothing really then? <laughs> well. When, it, when the water is murky, you got to be as close as possible again. Yeah. Um, but there's tricks you can use in the post processing when you get home on your computer to increase the black point, to increase the contrast. It'll yeah. turn the milkiness into dark shadows. That mm -hmm. can help, but there's a limit to is how much you can get away with without it looking really strange. So... Uh, the honest truth is I, I shoot everything on my cameras in raw mode and then convert them into usable JPEGs with software. And I do a lot of manipulation with the contrast, the black point, and the color balance to, to make it look like how my eye perceived it. Sure. And so it, it, I think uh, nowadays with digital, you have to have the techniques for diving, for taking the pictures, as well as editing and... Yeah you know how to present them so how about filters i mean do you use any filters on your camera when you're underwater or you just kind of do you just change the white balance i know someone said you can like just play with the white balance if you have a digital camera you know how, what do you do to kind of make it not so blued out when you're down below you know when you see the pictures so some of the more expensive point and shoot cameras like the olympus may offer a white a custom white balance uh, feature. You can try the presets like the underwater mode or the cloudy mode of white balance. Yeah. And you can try those things or leave it on automatic. Yeah. And after some experimentation, you'll determine which one is best. But if you want to be, if you're shooting with, without flashes, just completely with sunlight, you can yeah. do what's called a custom white balance, which basically entails taking a photo of the palm of your hand or a patch of sand or the blue midwater area with no subject in it, take that as a reference image. Mm -hmm. And then you go into the camera's menu and say, set this, this image as my reference for the custom white balance. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're diving with the same light conditions and the same depth range within about 10 feet, you your images will come out pretty much how it would be if you had a, an orange filter on. I don't really use filters. It's easy to do a custom white balance, not with digital. Yeah. 
mm -hmm. if you just have like a simple camera though, like a GoPro? Because I remember once, like it was years ago, but you get you had um you got me filters from my GoPro. Mm -hmm. So I do underwater and it worked out very nicely so what would people who just have like a simple gopro you know and they have a housing for it like what kind of filter would you recommend for that so i would recommend an orange filter for hawaiian conditions you would only use it beyond 20 feet and deeper because there's enough orange light in the sunlight in the shallows it'll be really orange if you leave the filter on and that in the shallows yeah. but uh, with video yes filters are usually employed and there's another thing where you can go into the, the like a GoPro and there's a native white balance feature if you use the Pro Tune options. Yeah. And native mode allows you to go into your software and do the most corrections to the image and get the, the colors quite accurate, but it does still take some skill to learn how to use the software. Yeah. I mean, I just got the Max. So I was, um, you know, when I was snorkeling, um, I, didn't use any filter, but it was very shallow most of the time. So it was fine, you know, uh, but, you know, just for people, because I mean, if you want to record, you're going to use something like a GoPro, right? Instead of your camera. So it's kind of good to know. Um, yeah. So um, what, I, what I would recommend is uh, using a scientific method to, to figure out what works with whatever camera you've got. And so when you first go in, say, just pick a like, you know, uh, take a take a toy or, or something, you know, as a subject and try testing three feet, two feet, one foot away. Uh -huh. um, and same thing for video, just do some shots of this. And, and re remember what your camera settings are, try different white balances, different filters. And so you can learn and write those things down on us, you know, some, or take some notes, mental notes, but don't try to do too much in one dive. Yeah. But, you want to try to find that sweet spot where your camera is working the best for that particular situation. And once you know that, write it down, remember it. And then when you go back in the water, you know, and you can get, you, all you need is a subject to work with you, then you got the good images. Um, I want to shift gears a bit because I want to talk about your business and your website. Um, so you also do scuba repair as well. And um, tell us about that. Okay, so I do scuba repairs, uh, regulators and BCDs. I serve most of the dive shops here on Oahu and even like American Samoa, um, Kwajalein, uh, the outer islands. So I've been um, quite busy with that. I've worked on gears, working in dive shops for like 30 years. So I have a lot of experience and I've accumulated all the training. Uh -huh. So uh, it was a, a move that was good for me to to stay employed in scuba, make decent a decent living, and still have the flexibility to go diving, go surfing, go traveling when I when I want to. Um, but there aren't that many qualified technicians uh, in the islands right now, so it's yeah. uh, it was a good time to get into the business. About eight years I've been in doing it full time, mm -hmm. um, and the website for the marine life photography is uh, identification tool, which is pretty much the a product of my UH uh, days when I wanted to help other students learn to, how to identify marine life. And so it's, it's not a profit thing. It's just to help, to help. It's, yeah, it's completely people. free. It's wonderful. I mean, yeah. I remember once I went to the, like one of the aquariums near Nimitz and they sell all sorts of tropical fish, beautiful fish. And they said that they used your website to identify all the fish. I was like, oh my God, I know him. <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it, uh, one of the, the, the faculty at UH, Hilo, um, when I donated slides for them, he says, hey, you know what? I'll set you up with a server. I'll give you some software, show you how to make a web page, And mm -hmm. that's how it started. And I haven't changed it much since then. It's been running, for, running, running since 1994. Yeah. Have yeah. you added more to it recently, or it's been about every every um, few weeks? I get an email with a "What's this slug?" You know, from uh -huh. from just divers around around oh, cool. Hawaii and beyond, mm -hmm. and I identify it and I say, "Hey, can I share that on a new species page?" And I, I keep adding new species, and usually it's from people who are contributing. So mm -hmm. it's a tool for everybody to to help 
educate others. Yeah. And how about, I mean, it just because you've done so much diving and been here on the island and everything, where do you think, you know, is, is a good place for diving or snorkeling on Oahu and also on the other islands? Where are some good sites where people can go snorkeling or diving? Um, I would say that for Oahu, I really love Shark's Cove, the North Shore in mm -hmm. the summertime when it's really, you know, flat and calm. Yeah. There's a lot of fish. It's it's got interesting topography. So there's a lot of everything for people to see. Mm -hmm. um, Hanama Bay can have nice fishes, but it's also usually rough. It takes a lot of effort to swim out and back in. So mm -hmm. it can be good. Usually early in the morning in the winter time, it yeah. can be good. On the other islands, uh, I mean Molokini on Maui is really good. Yeah. And like cathedrals is good. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can go to Kauai, go to uh, Niihau. That's yeah, really I mean, good. That was great. The monk seals there. I, I went. Actually, I have some videos that I never uploaded. That I eventually want to do. Yeah, and then if you go to Kona, um, Puako is a yeah. great uh, snorkeling and diving area for shore diving. Mm -hmm. And of course, the uh, Honau now um, city of refuge or two step. Mm -hmm. That's also oh, a really good beautiful. place. Yeah. And for purely snorkeling, then Kahalu'u, right uh, south of Kailua town, is also very good. Oh, really? I haven't been there, actually. It's really good. Uh, go in the morning early before the parking lot gets filled like anywhere yeah. else. <laughs> and tons of fish. Mm -hmm. And they're friendly. They're good for pictures. A lot of oh, turtles. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then abroad, um, for, for a lot of everything, Indonesia is still the, the best. best. Oh. Yeah, West Papua, Raja mm -hmm. Ampat. Uh, Komodo, those areas are amazing. It's yeah. pricey, but yeah. that's if you want the best bang for your buck, yeah, mm -hmm. Indonesia. So what kind of stuff do you see? Just more fishes or um, more fish and more? Everything. Everything? Uh, because the, the Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines region is considered the hub of biodiversity in the ocean. Oh. So you'll see, you know, a thousand kinds of fishes, 500 kinds wow. of corals, whereas Hawaii has 75 kinds of corals and 200 kinds of fishes. Yeah, it just, yeah. as you radiate out away from that region, the number of species goes down. Oh, that's um, interesting. I didn't know that. And there's a lot of currents between all those islands. And so mm -hmm. more current brings more, more food, more plankton. And so yeah. the reefs are very rich. They have corals and soft corals and sea fans and mm -hmm. manta rays. And it's just so much and there's not a ton of dynamite fishing going on there yeah. in Indonesia. There's some areas that are bad, but as you get away from those populated areas, it's still quite, quite nice. Yeah. What would you say, have you noticed anything over the years of diving and snorkeling and just being in the water here? Have you noticed changes in the coral and just like the fish, everything? Have, what, have you noticed any changes, I guess? Yes, um, in the, the maybe the, the 40 years since I've been going in the ocean, I did notice that fish population has gone down considerably. There's just a lot of people. There's yeah, a lot of people catching of fish. People. Yeah. Um, you know, there's many different fishing, you know, aquarium fish, yeah. feet, you know, spearing, people netting. Spearing. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, it's just less and less. I quit spear fishing back 25 years ago because it was getting difficult. <laughs> With a, with a yeah. pole spear. Um, coral health has declined because it, the water is getting warmer. Mm -hmm. um, there's coral diseases coming in. It's happening all around the world. Yeah. Every ocean yeah. has had the same problems. So there's less, less of everything. Yeah, sometimes it makes me want to cry when I see people spear fishing because they have these beautiful fish on the, on the spear. And, you know, and you're just thinking, oh my gosh. And, you know, they're just... Because when you bring them to the surface, they somehow don't look as beautiful as they do underwater. Yeah. And it's also, right. you know, when you think about it, these, these, a lot of free fish can live five to 25, 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. You know, they live a long time. They're, they live longer than, than cats and dogs. Yeah. So you think about that, you know, they, and there's a lot of predators in the ocean. So they can't reproduce and, and maintain their population mm -hmm. if they have that long of a lifespan. Yeah. How about the larger wildlife? Have you noticed anything different with like the sharks, the turtles, the dolphins or whales? I don't know if you used to see, I mean, I, I've never seen a whale here actually in Hawaii, at least. 
I mean, from a distance, but not close up ever. But I don't know if you've ever, you know, what it was like 40 years ago. Um, I think, well, I, I don't really know about the whales that much, but the turtles have definitely come back. You couldn't see turtles, you know, as easily as you can now. And they're coming on the beaches and nesting. Even when Manalo here, they're nesting on the beach. Oh, wow. That's, there's a lot more now because not being hunted. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, the sharks have been depleted a lot from, yeah. you know, uh, those, those nets and those, uh, those yeah. uh, foreign yeah. vessels coming in and taking a lot of sharks. So mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not the way it used to be. Yeah, that's really sad to think about that. Um, do you, uh, do you want to tell us about some of the photos you took? There's some really interesting ones, like the one with the whale. How did you capture that? So in Tonga, you can actually legally swim with whales if you're on a tour. Um, they do allow snorkeling with the whales. Um, there are some rules to, to make it safe and not too irritating. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also very rough there. So when you go on the boat, it can be like five hours of rough yeah. water <laughs> yeah. and waiting. And it's like you're fishing, but you're not catching any fish because you're not dragging any lines. And so it's, you're out in the middle of nowhere waiting to find whales. So yeah. um, that was from Tonga. Um, I had a week of time in the water, only got two swims with the whales. And that's about the best image. It's not, it wasn't like it's very amazing, cool. you know? Yeah, it wasn't what I expected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But even to be able to swim with the males, that's wonderful. It um, is. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, but anyway, we're out of time, so we'll have to wrap it up. Um, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. Um, we've been talking to Kyoki Sender, um, the marine wildlife photographer and scuba enthusiast. And um, it's been really informative. And I want to say thank you to Eric, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of the crew at ThinkTech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you on May 26th for more of Healthy Planet on ThinkTech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. Our next show will be about how a whole foods plant-based diet can help with kidney disease with our special guest, Dr. Shivam Joshi, nephrologist. If you have ideas for the show, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com for more information on my projects, including future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.